Good evening. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leaders series, Designing with Brick Precast Panels. My name is Amanda and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them, their cultures and to elders, past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Austral Precast. Austral Precast is a leading provider of high quality and innovative, customizable precast concrete product solutions. It services a range of markets, including multi-residential, commercial, industrial, community and civil sectors. Throughout the past 110 years, the face of building materials has continued to evolve. We're here for a lifetime of living. This is Brickworks. More than brick, and more than just building products, we are a foundation for today's lifestyle and a leader for today's style. We manufacture a wide range of building products. Products like no other. Local and international innovation. Sourced from around the world to exceed customer expectations. Distinctive and luxurious products. Beautiful products that stand the test of time. Building inspiration and innovation with an unmatched standing of style. This is Brickworks. Today, we will hear from two speakers followed by a live audience Q&A, and I encourage you to send questions through to our speakers by the chat box. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Alyssa Hernandez Montero. Having worked in Arab's London, Hong Kong and Sydney offices, Alyssa is a senior engineer with skills in facade design and project management for a wide range of international projects which span commercial, residential and arts and culture sectors and incorporate a wide range of construction materials and systems. Alyssa has experience on projects at different stages of design, construction and in use, with special focus on performance compliance within commercial limits. Please welcome Alyssa Hernandez Montero. Good afternoon, all, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so today I'll be going through um, initially specific aspects to, to be considered during early design stages when we're looking at um, the use of handset brickwork versus brick face precast. So before we get into the specifics of the use of brick face precast, I, I thought I would just give a bit of an introduction around the handset brick in, in, in itself. So historically, handset brickwork has been used for, for centuries. Um, and more recently, we're seeing it uh, used on, on projects such as stations, warehouses, as well as commercial and residential buildings, um, either in the form of new bricks or um, refurbishing or re reusing existing brickwork. Um, on the screen in here, you can see an example of Coal Drops Yard in London, uh, where the existing brickwork um, from the coal uh, drop lines themselves was refurbished as part of the overall site redevelopment. Similar to Coal Drops Yard, um, we can see in here on the left hand side uh, the example of St. Pancras uh, Station in London, as well as uh, one of the buildings in Tasmania University, where um, similarly to Coal Drops, the brick uh, facades uh, of the existing buildings were maintained um, and refurbished as the buildings uh, progressed in, in design um, and also as uh, upgrades and changes were uh, carried out throughout the years. It, so as can, as can be seen, the brick is a brick itself is a highly durable material, and it's currently undergoing uh, an architectural revival. So we fast forward to 2022, where uh, precast construction in general um, is being utilized widely in projects due to a series of benefits that we will go through in the following slides. Um, specifically, this includes the um, a topic of today's event, brick face precast. 
So before uh, we go and, and delve into the specific Greek face precast design, I thought I, I, ju- I would just note that other kinds of finishes can be achieved with precast facades. Um, and in here, you can see examples on the left-hand side of terracotta face uh, precast panels in a project in London, as well as uh, stone face precast panels on the right-hand side. So this sh- comes to show that precast as a, as a material can offer an infinite can offer infinite possibilities that can suit the visual intent. So after this brief introduction, I think that the first question that we, we might be asking ourselves is, why should we be using brief face precast on our project? So there's a, a wide variety of benefits and advantages from using a precast a construction in projects. So first, the panels themselves are manufactured in the factory, meaning that a tighter quality control is in place. This will result in a reduced risks from the, uh, a visual point of view, but also from a design and construction point of view, and an overall high quality product. Currently, panels uh, can be manufactured uh, locally in Australia, but there is an existing precast industry. And in here, you can see some images of a brick face precast panels being uh, manufactured on the left hand side. Um, Also, an example of a brick face precast uh, project in London with picture frame uh, type panels and infill windows. And at the bottom of that, you can see some uh, brick face precast panels being stored in the precaster's yard awaiting to be delivered to site. Um, in addition to this, using precast panels also means that the, the cladding can be install, installed at a much faster rate on site. So on the left hand side, uh, I've included examples of a more typical handset brick construction where initially we would need to install the, the bracket trees to support the brickwork in addition to all of the, the components that will be located within the cavity itself, so any insulation, fire stops, etc. Uh, following this, the uh, individual brickworks would need to be hand set into position, which would require um, longer periods of time, time for installation. On the other hand, we have brick face precast panels, which, as I mentioned before, would be manufactured off site. They would then be delivered um, to the construction site itself, lifted and fixed in place, resulting in a much faster um, installation process, as well as a much faster weatherproofing of the facade itself. This also means that there is a reduction in the amount of time spent working at height. So, it, of course, this is a benefit from a health and safety point of view. Uh, so all of this can be achieved uh, by uh, without compromising the durability and achieving the architectural intent. Um, in addition to all of this, uh, precast actually offers quite a, a bit of flexibility in terms of designing and uh, manufacturing. So first off, um, th- there's different support strategies that can be utilized whenever we're looking at brick phase precast construction. Um, The first off is um, using panels which are themselves load bearing. So they become part of the the support strategy of the overall building. And I will cover what the the specifics of this are in the following slides. Alternatively, the uh, panels can become similar to any other uh, cladding panels um, used in facades where they are fixed and restrained back to the primary structure, but they don't necessarily add um, to the, um, the support of the overall building itself. Um, in addition to all of this, and you can see in the in the geometry diagrams on the screen just now, there's different uh, shapes that can be achieved with precast panels. Um, you can achieve, for example, picture frame, a, a picture frame geometry like the one on the top uh, right hand side, um, which also gives the, the added advantage of being able to install the infill glazing panels in, in the factory and for them to be transported all together on site and installed at a much faster rate. Alternatively, other geometries such as T shaped, any linear, horizontal, or vertical uh, panels, as well as horseshoe, M shaped, etc., can be achieved with. Um, precast construction. So in reality, the opportunities are infinite. So after understanding the advantages of a brick face precast, um, the, the next question might be, where do we start the design process? 
So first off, it's important to have a look at the relevant quote standards and guides that are available to us to be able to define what this facade components will need to achieve and any specific requirements in terms of manufacturing, installation, etc. So locally, uh, there are Australian standards available which cover the individual components, uh, both the concrete and brickwork uh, elements of the, of the build-up itself. So it is important to have a look at, at those ones to understand locally what are the, the performance requirements of the, the individual components. Um, also, the National Code of Practice is available to us, uh, which highlights the um, the specific any specific requirements to be considered for precast concrete elements uh, within the building construction. In addition to all of this, uh, there's also international standards that we can have a look at um, and utilize in during the design process of brick face precast panels. Um, specifically, uh, we have seen the British standards and, and American standards being used in the past, and they actually focus specifically on the, um, the design and manufacturing of architectural precast concrete themselves. Um, and then similarly, uh, we also ha have the International Manual uh, for Architectural Precast Concrete provided by PCI available to us to help during the design and manufacturing of this kind of construction. After considering the, the local and international requirements, it, one can then start looking at the project specific uh, design intent um, for the building or, uh, or project that we're looking at. So the first step will be to uh, understand the architectural elevations and to carry out panelization studies to understand what sizes they, the panels will be, how they can be designed, uh, what weights they will have, how they will be fixed, etc. So throughout all of this process, the, one of the main aims will be to try to standardize the type of panels that are used, um, because this will help to reduce the number of precast molds and formwork that will need to be manufactured, but it will also result in a more efficient manufacturing process as well as a more cost-effective solution. Um, so as part of this panelization study, it will be important to look at the, the project-specific crane lifting limitations. So understanding what crane will be used in the project, as well as um, the, the reach of the crane and the maximum weights that the crane will be able to lift will be key to just to ensure that all of the precast panels can be installed in the building. Um, in addition to all of this, uh, it's also important to look at the, the manufacturing and the transportation limitations. So coordination with the, the precasters is, is key to understand what will be their own manufacturing um, capabilities, so how big the panels can be or how heavy the panels can be, but also to understand what uh, transport limitations will be in place and will need to be considered whenever the, the panels are transported from the yard to the site itself. So based on, on this panelization studies, one can then go and assess uh, how the individual panels will be supported. So in here, you can see an example of the, the studies that were carried out for the same project that you saw on the previous page. Um, so as I mentioned before, the, the precast facades can be supported or can work in two different ways. It can work as load bearing components or as cladding components. If we're looking at a precast facade, which is load bearing, um, the panels themselves will help, uh, will be part of the, the structural strategy itself. Um, and the way that this is achieved is that the, the precast panels are designed to support part of the the loads that will be applied to the primary structure on the building. Um, and then they are a uh, manufacturer to suit that. They're then delivered on site and um, they are uh, fixed to the um, surrounding primary structure if made in precast panels themselves as a uh, stitching connections, or if say the, the slabs or the slabage uh, beams are, are cast on site, the, the panels themselves will incorporate a series of, of bars on the back of them, which will be then connected to the reinforcement cages of the, the slab and the um, slab edge beams. And then it will allow for a full connection to the, the primary structure whenever the concrete is poured for those components. On the other hand, if the pre-cut itself is self-supporting and acts like a cladding panel, which is the example on the screen just now, um, one will look to review. One will need to look initially at the um, the locations for the support brackets for the gravity support brackets, uh, which will be um, 
will be applying large loads onto the primary structure. Um, in the example on the screen just now, those gravity support brackets are shown as red dots, um, and a 3D sketch is shown on the top uh, right-hand side. So, of course, the, the location and the load supplied um, from this uh, brackets onto the primary structure will need to be coordinated with the structural engineer as a degree of, of changing or up upgrading may be required to ensure that the, the primary structure is, is sufficient to support the loads from the facade itself. So very similar to any other design uh, process uh, when looking at other types of facades. Um, as a recommendation, it would be that whenever the, um, the precast panels are uh, you are supported as cladding components rather than load bearing, um, is for the support brackets to be located as close to the columns as possible because this will allow for a more direct load path as well as a reduction in the size of the panel to panel joints. And I will explain that a little bit in the following slide. Um, in addition to all of this, we will need to also consider the locations for the restraint brackets, which in the project on the screen just now were located um, where the, the blue dots are. And you can see an example uh, of a 3D sketch of what this restraint brackets may look like. Um, but this will also be a requirement that will help to keep the panels in place. Um, so, as I mentioned before, based on the, the panelization strategy, as well as the support um, of the individual panels, the, um, the, the precast will need to, to be reviewed in terms of panel weights, and this will need to be coordinated with the structural engineer. Um, in addition to this, coordination needs to take place um, to understand the resulting movement between panels, as they will be fixed in different locations and may result in um, differential deflection between the, the panel edges. And this needs to be allowed for in the detailing and the sizing of the panel to panel joints. So in here, you can see an example of studies that were carried out for one specific project where different panelization geometries were analyzed and coordinated with the structural engineer to understand how um, loads would be applied to the primary structure, how this was, would affect the, the design of the structural components, but also to uh, conclude what the minimum joint size and will be um, based on the differential deflection between panels. Um, other criteria to, uh, that will need to be assessed as part of the, the design process will be um, the location and interfacing with any glazing components. So they, that might be that the punch windows or the, the glazing buildups are, um, as I mentioned before, they could be installed uh, in the factory and transported as an overall panel, or this may need to be installed following um, the, the positioning of the precast panels on site. Thermal requirements are also important, especially nowadays with a more stringent thermal performance requirements of uh, facades and buildings. Um, and specifically looking at the um, at the installation location, the type of insulation that is used with special consideration on, on fire performance, um, as well as the overall buildup um, of the insulation and, and the thermal line. Um, air seal location will also need to be defined um, with the aim of trying to reduce the risk of any um, condensation within the buildup itself. So of course, an assessment needs to be carried out for the, the location of the project that we're working on. Um, any specific fire requirements will also need to be reviewed, um, as this may result in a need to upgrade um, any of this, the specific basic designs of the precast panels, as well as uh, providing any, um, any protection or additional protection to the, the bracketry itself. Um, and finally, uh, looking at the, the actual weathering of the facade, both from a, um, a staining point of view and understanding how um, the facade will age over time, if there's any spe specific hotspots where um, staining may occur, um, and understanding how this can be, be addressed. Um, but as well, it, weathering from the, the weatherproofing, overall weatherproofing point of view will be key to understand as we need to ensure that the facades are weather tight and no water um, is allowed to enter the building through the, the cladding system. So, so far we've looked at the concrete specific considerations, but we should also not forget about the brick selection. Um, initially, uh, we can do a, a reviews with the architects to understand what is the, the visual intent for the project. 
And this can be carried out by looking at uh, previous examples, um, but also looking at uh, handheld samples. By all of this process, we'll be able to then understand what type of brick uh, we want to use for the project, how this brick will be manufactured, will it be handmade, will it be extruded, etc. But then also if there will be any requirements for additional finishes, um, such as, for example, a glaze, any anti-graffiti coatings, etc. So depending on the brick selected, um, the specific interface between the, the brick and the, the poured concrete will be, will be different. Um, so their recommendation generally is to um, allow for the, the back of the brick to include any openings or any slots or grooves, which will ensure that there is concrete engagement when the, the concrete itself is poured onto the back of the mold. Um, and you can see an example of this in the sketch in the top right hand corner. So by, by detailing the interface between the two components this way, we're able to provide additional resilience, but also reduce the risk of any disengagement of the bricks and any potential falls. Um, as I mentioned before, the types of bricks that are selected uh, will affect the way that this engagement is, is achieved and is detailed. So for example, for thin bricks, um, the, the bricks themselves uh, may include um, additional groups in the back, as you can see on the bottom left-hand corner, or uh, stainless steel rods can be included on the back of the bricks to be able to achieve that engagement. Um, if standard bricks on the other side are used, then these bricks can be cut in half. And you can see an example on the top left-hand corner. And actually by cutting this sometimes, uh, because of the way that these bricks are manufactured, there, there's already inherent um, uh, engagement uh, openings or slots that will be available to us to uh, be able to create that connection between the, the brick face and the concrete backing. So manufacturing of the precast panels is also important to be, it's important to understand how this is achieved. Um, and I'll just briefly go through through the specifics of this. Um, so as any other precast panels, it, the, there will be a, we will need a formwork or, or molds to be prepared to um, match the geometry and the design of the building. Following this, the bricks themselves will be set out face down, as you can see on the top uh, left-hand corner, um, and then the, um, the reinforcement cage will be installed above this. Following this, the concrete will be poured and will be allowed to cure to achieve the strength of the panel. Following all of this, um, the panels then can be rotated, the formwork can be struck, and uh, the, the precast can then be lifted and positioned into storage until they are required for delivery to the site. So some final details that uh, should be considered uh, whenever um, brick face precast is being reviewed on a project will be, um, for example, what will be the resulting embodied karma of using this kind of um, this kind of solution. So uh, we, we touched on the use of load bearing um, load bearing precast concrete, which will help to achieve architectural intents, but also have the, the added advantage of um, being able to, to add to the overall uh, performance of the primary structure of the building. Additionally to this, uh, we will need to, to assess how the panels will be delivered and installed on site. So whether the crane that we currently have for the project will be large enough, will it be able to install all of the panels, and can the panels themselves be delivered to the site itself? Um, finally, a trade coordination is required between different uh, subcontractors. So the, precasting, uh, the precaster will be providing the, the precast panel itself, but then any info windows will, will need to be provided by a different subcontractor. So that interface needs to be coordinated to ensure a performance of the overall buildup. On a similar way, the, the details, the interfacing details at the, the ground floor or any terraces need to be assessed to ensure that the building is weathertight. So after looking at the considerations uh, when designing brick face precast facade, we, we can now have a look at some present projects to see where this, um, this strategy has been utilized. So the first project that we will be looking at is Melbourne Connect. 
Um, and here you can see in the picture uh, the brick face recast component at the entrance. Um, it's actually the, the panel that is located just above the doors. Um, and the, th there's several reasons why a brick face was selected as a solution for this project. Uh, first off, it allowed for a, a simplified brick support a solution uh, or brick support condition. The reason for this is because of the inclined um, uh, the, the, the inclined geometry of the of the panel. It would have been very difficult to just uh, directly stack the bricks. Um, so each one of the rows would have needed to be individually supported to ensure that the bricks were safe, safely attached in place. Um, so by using brick face precast concrete, the panel uh, was uh, constructed in the factory with the full engagement of the bricks onto the concrete backing, therefore ensuring safety of the connection. Uh, additional to this, the, um, the surrounding panels, uh, which you can't directly see on the picture in here, um, were, were made of, of concrete face precasts as well. So uh, in the, the, the two sides and the inclined panel were delivered to sites individually. They were spliced together and connected to the load bearing structure of the building. And following this, the, um, the handset brickwork on the two sides were, were laid. Um, the reason why the, the, the two sites were not manufactured as brick face precast concrete was um, because, as you can see in the image on the screen just now, um, they, there were some um, interactive transparent bricks which uh, required specific access um, and specific considerations during installation. So uh, the as I mentioned before, the the overall um, the overall panels, the buildups were, um, were were forming part of the the primary structural support strategy. So overall, the project uh, achieved the following. So we we managed to simplify um, the the brick support condition as well as making it safer. Um, the the design was efficient um, as it was. Part, it formed part of the of the low bearing um, of the primary structure, or the, the support conditions of the primary structure. And it also, as you can see, provided visual consistency between the brick face precast components and the handset um, elements. And overall, it, it's a high quality result. So the second project that we will be looking at is Arden Station, uh, which is one of the new uh, Melbourne Metro stations uh, being constructed. Um, as you can see from the architectural render on the screen just now, um, the, the design intent or the architectural intent was to have a very large open space um, with the underside of the arches uh, being made or achieving a brick finish. So due to the specific setting out, as I mentioned, the large space, um, as well as the stringent structural and security requirements for the project, handset brickwork was not really an option in this, in this condition. Um, so for this reason, the use of brick face precast was selected. So to achieve the, the project intent, the arches, which you can see in the image in here, were divided into three uh, individual panels. So obviously they were all manufactured off-site, individually transported, and once delivered, they were uh, fixed together to form the overall arch that you can see on the screen here, but also to create the connection to the vertical components themselves. Um, an interesting detail about this project uh, is that due to the, the, the stringent security requirements, um, there was actually quite a lot of thorough testing carried out on the, the brick engagement uh, onto the precast concrete. Um, so yet again, to highlight the importance of, of having a strong connection between the two elements of our uh, brick face precast buildup. Uh, the project is currently under construction, so we're hoping to be able to, to soon be able to see the finished result. And the final project that we'll be looking at is uh, plot a, a included within the television center development in London. Unlike the, the two examples that we've looked at so far, um, and due to the specific project restrictions, it was not possible for the brick face precast panels in this project to be um, utilized as, as load bearing. And therefore they were designed as cladding components. So they were self-supporting and they were directly fixed to the primary structure of the building. Um, specifically, the facade was made of M-shaped panels 
Um, and as I mentioned, they, they were supported back to the primary structure and a similar strategy as we, we saw pre in the previous slides. So Brickface Precast uh, was selected on the project for um, several reasons. So first off, it eliminated the need for any uh, scaffolding to allow for external access. Um, it also allowed for fast installation of both the precast panels and the punched windows in between, and therefore uh, a very fast weathering and enclosing of the building. And it also ensured a tight quality control under factory conditions. Uh, as an interesting uh, final thought on this project, so following the success of, of, the, of, of the building, um, the developer has actually asked that for any future projects incorporating a, a brick finish for brick face precast to be considered as much as possible as they were very happy with the results in the project. So I hope that with this short presentation, you now have a better understanding of the details to be considered at early stages when looking to use brick face precast facades. So on that note, I will leave you with the following question. Is Brickface Precast the right solution for your project? Thank you. Thank you, Elisa, for a great presentation. And now I'd like to welcome our second and final speaker, Dean Silman. Dean graduated as a Bachelor of Civil Engineering from Rand Afrikaans University in 2004 before working as a site project engineer on civil and building projects in South Africa. Dean has been working in the Australian construction industry for 14 years, the last 12 as a project manager, working on predominantly commercial and multi-residential projects in Toowoomba, Townsville and Brisbane. Please welcome Dean Sulman. Thank you very much, Amanda. I uh, appreciate being here and hopefully we can shed some light on uh, this new case study. So we're going to be talking about my first project involving brickworks and the precast uh, panel bricks at 465 St. Paul's Terrace. Uh, just completed this one last year and yeah, uh, for my first one, uh, I think it turned out to be quite a success. As a background, the project is in Fortitude Valley in Brisbane consists of 35 apartments and a commercial tenancy on the ground floor, so mixed use, uh, spread over eight levels with rooftop gardens and recreational area. Uh, two basements uh, with the car lift, so that's, that's another nifty feature of the building. There's a few important factors we had to consider uh, when thinking about panel bricks. Uh, the design intent, uh, the cost of the system, any program advantages and whether waterproofing would be compromised. Uh, all these factors in a residential build like this are very important and uh, we've got to weigh up uh, all these factors uh, moving forward. So I'll take them through one by one with you. In terms of design intent, the client who owns the building outright wanted a classic brick New York look uh, but mixed with modern clean off form concrete. So we thought at the time uh, the engineers and architects had designed in situ concrete walls and uh, brick tile and brickwork. And we thought, how can we make this system work uh, on a you know high rise commercial building where we don't really want to be involved with the domestic bricklayers per se. Internally, uh, the client wanted very clean lines no steps in walls or too many bulkheads in the ceilings. So we had to figure out how we can make this work structurally. Uh, and then we also had to think about how we can use brick on an eight story building. Uh, you know, it's just not done these days. So we had to think about lightweight construction and loads going through the building as well, which you would have heard about before. The first thing we were looking at was cost. Um, the savings compared to the other systems are very, very intricate and obviously would dif differ uh, project by project and even time-wise. This project was priced and completed towards the end of 2020 and uh, into the back end of 2021. Now, traditional brick veneer plus lightweight internal walls is slightly cheaper in the region of 5%, um, but it has its own design considerations that we had to think about. As I mentioned, the client wanted uh, straight walls and no bulkheads, 
The problem is that you know brick walls uh, would ne- would need uh, more internal columns, and uh, the slab would have to be redesigned to make use of non-structural brickwork. Now, the original system that was thought proposed was blockwork plus brick tiles that were glued onto the blockwork, but this would need blockwork, waterproofing, and then a separate trade, for instance, tilers to then glue these brick tiles on, and that ended up working out to be about 16% more expensive. Uh, the tended system and the original proposed system was blockwork plus brick tiles on a galvanized rail system. Now, this has been done in, in the past, just about 12% more expensive. The only problem was you had to rely on multiple suppliers. There weren't any suppliers who would do the whole system as a supply and install. So you'd have to purchase the bricks, send it to a third party who cuts the brick tiles out, then delivers it back to site with the galvanized rails. And then you'd have to engage uh, an installer to install the whole system. So just the potential for logistics errors and problems skyrockets. And, you know, we just try to simplify trades on site where we don't get involved with, you know, actually doing this work on site, whereas we can manage the risk out. We'd prefer that. Program wise, it was very, very efficient to install the brickwork directly onto the slab the day after the concrete pour, as you would do with a typical precast slab. Um, the only trade required afterwards is joint sealing externally and internally. Uh, with no further wet trades, you know, in, in all the other systems, you'd need waterproofers plus uh, a, a bricklayer or someone to glue the brick tiles on the system. Um, this meant that high-rise buildings would work well uh, with a screen system that progressively jumps up as no requirement for for further wet trades. We used scaffold uh, where we could have used the screens, but it was very definitely the same system. Um, I would definitely say we saved close on 10% on our structural program without the need to rely on block work um, to be completed before commencing the formwork for the slab above. Uh, yeah, uh, precast in our world is uh, one of the definitely good advantage to, to using uh, typical concrete construction. From a waterproofing point of view, uh, as you mentioned, any of the traditional systems would require block work, waterproofing, and some kind of third-party tiler or brickwork installer. There's just a major possibility of the waterproofing being compromised in the situation. Uh, given it's a high-rise building and anything would be exposed on the outside, it be, would be very difficult to attend the building in future to rectify the breach. Um, so the precast panning with the joint ceiling was just the obvious choice. It's a complete system. And, you know, you only waterproof the panel to panel connections horizontally. You can choose to do uh, vertical connections if you want. But typically, it's just where panels sit on each other. And it's an all-in-one system. On this project, we uh, typically had about 87 brick panels uh, that we worked on. They were on average 200 mil thick. Now that was uh, 180 mil structural panel plus the 20 mil brick layer. Total square meters was around 700 square meters uh, at a cost of close on $400,000, which worked out to $571 per square meter. Now that's a uh, pretty pretty good price from a precast panel point of view. The typical precast rates at the moment are around 400 to $450 per square meter. Um, and you know we paid a premium for the brick panels, uh, but at the time we we weighed up program versus the quality outcomes that we were getting, and we were very happy with it. Uh, we had about two hundred and seventy tons of panels, and an average of three tons per panel uh, to all eight levels. Uh, as you can see, you know we worked really well with uh, Austral Precast on this project. It was their first time running the uh, brick panel system in uh, Queensland and uh, yeah we are privileged for them to try it out for us uh, try it out for us and uh, we we worked really well visiting their factory trying to get a a gauge of what they would look like they sent us a few sample panels Um, we also you know engaged the client engaged the architect to visit the factory Uh, it was it was a first and we had to make sure that what we were giving the client was uh, what they had uh, expected all in all as I can uh, attest the project was a great success the client was happy with what they received and we were happy with what Austral precast had promised us um, but 
there obviously are some lessons learned um, with everything. You know, you basically will move forward and improve the systems. What we found was the shop drawing process was extremely detailed. Um, you need to allow enough time for procurement and shop drawing to take place and a lot of coordination between architects, engineers, Austral and uh, your builder. Um, it's going to be a, a tough one because uh, on a brick panel, every single panel was fully modeled with each brick piece uh, modeled and we had to basically get the layout correct. If you start off your first panels on level one incorrect, by the time you get to level eight, uh, that error gets compounded and the bricks will just not line up uh, the way you want. You need to think about corner bricks. You need to think about bricks around window openings. Are they going to be uh, detailed as uh, a sill brick or any other detail? You need to think about joint sizes. Uh, also, how bricks go over the top of panels. We had bricks, uh, panel bricks, uh, over on our roof level, uh, and unfortunately, you know, it's a it's a constraint of precast where you couldn't put bricks in and pour it uh, at the at the top of your panel because that's where your lifting lugs have to go. So we came up with a solution, also precast left certain bricks out where the lifting lugs uh, would go and those panels were lifted in place. And later on, we had uh, the lifting uh, panels then bricked in again. So they really looked like they were never there. How would you protect your brick tiles during construction? That's something we you know, learned uh, along the way. We had a few panel bricks that uh, after they were installed, just trades walking past or uh, putting tools on near them, just chipping away. Um, we then uh, contacted also precast and they were really great, uh, came out and inspected and where they could, they repaired uh, little pieces of bricks. Um, but I would suggest that, you know, you don't damage anything larger than a full brick. It just, just uh, it'd be very difficult to, uh, to repair. Um, something that, you know, we don't really think about too often is the joint ceiling. You know, when you do uh, precast concrete, your joint ceiling is typically gray and uh, it's dependent on the type of uh, color of concrete you're using in your panel bricks. Uh, we used uh, typical uh, normal gray concrete for our panels. Um, so we had a gray joint and, you know, we tried joint sealing the joints between panels in gray. And because the joint's slightly larger, about 20 mils compared to the brick joint of 10 mils, they just stood out um, and they stood out because they were shiny gray joint sealant. Um, we then ripped those out after doing a few lines and changed to uh, a color that matched our bricks closer. And uh, yeah, the, the difference was remarkable. We, uh, we definitely uh, learned our lesson there. And I'd say try to match the joint, the joint color to the color of the brick. I mean, the last lesson that I would say you need to think about is the client expectations. What do they want? Are they expecting uh, a clean brick building? Uh, are they expecting it to be a panel or a hybrid in between? Um, you know, our client was expecting brickwork um, and we spent a long time in design phase trying to uh, uh, manage those expectations. Uh, and when they, you know, looked at the building and uh, when we finished, they were amazed and, you know, people still drive past and uh, I take visitors there all the time and they don't believe that it's uh, a brick panel. They, they think we did some brickwork up there and uh, I'd like to keep that illusion going. <laughs> Uh, so all in all, I'd say it was a very fulfilling project. Uh, I would say um, do your homework, uh, make sure you can work within your budgets, uh, work with your design engineers and architects, and uh, also just check with your client and, and make sure that's something that they want. Uh, I appreciate uh, giving the having the time to talk about the project and hopefully we can do a few more uh, moving forward. Thank you very much. A big thank you to Dean and Eliza for two great presentations at tonight's Thought Leaders Designing with Brick Precast Panels. It's now your turn to get involved, so please ask our speakers questions via the chat box, and if you can, who you're directing your question to. Also, a big thank you to everyone who took the time to send questions through whilst registering for today's webinar. I might start with you, Dean. Uh, we've had a question that's come in from Benjamin, and Benjamin is watching from New South Wales. Good evening to you. Benjamin's question is, what are the relative pros and cons to this system compared to precast concrete panels, ACA tilt-up panels? Dean. 
Uh, hi, Benjamin. I think uh, I covered quite a few of those pros and cons in the presentation. Um, I guess if you just treat it as a traditional precast panel, that's exactly what it is. Um, it's will really be a construction project with a precast panel uh, with bricks attached to it. So you can't really compare it to precast. I'd say the pros and cons should really be comparing it to traditional brick construction or another method of brick tile slip installation. Um, yeah, but uh, typically in commercial construction, if we can go high rise with precast, it's a much better solution overall for program uh, and cost. Thanks, Dean. And bringing you in, Elisa, we've had a question coming from Robert, and Robert's in Victoria, asking, can the inserts count towards the effective thickness of the panel from a fire rating perspective? Great question, Robert. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Robert, for the question. Um, I would say that your your best approach would be to consider the um, the concrete component when looking at the fire and also the structural performance of the panels themselves because at the end of the day the bricks themselves are are almost let's call them a veneer attached to the to the panel um, so what's giving you the the structural and the just the overall performance is actually the concrete backing thanks very much Alyssa, for that um, Dean, back to you. Uh, Vera, Vera's in New South Wales. Good evening, Vera. Is asking you, Dean, are there any special waterproofing requirements or do you follow standard precast waterproofing? Dean. There's been quite a few questions on uh, waterproofing, Amanda. Uh, and I would say in our project, because we had load bearing precast panels, we followed standard precast waterproofing. So what we did was waterproof the horizontal uh, tops of precast before the next panels were put down. Uh, and that's just best, best practice. There are a few other methods you can use like water stop or waterproof your vertical joints. But at the end of the day, it's, it's up to each uh, project and there'll be some nuances uh, on each one. And I guess follow your architectural details and your relevant codes of practice as well. Thanks. And uh, I'm assuming that covers off Jake's question, who's also watching from New South Wales, who asks, how do you ensure the panels are waterproof for weatherproofing? Um, Dean, um, have we covered that? Yes, I think uh, there have been quite a few waterproof questions and, and that would cover it. It would really be uh, referred to your standard standards and codes of practice and ensure your building is designed. And it also covers your FP 1.4 uh, facade a report for the building. So it would make sure that your building is completely watertight before you move forward with the design. Thanks, Dean, for that. Um, moving up the country to Queensland, we've had a question from John. Uh, John's asking you, Elisa, um, what about the differences in thermal properties? Thanks, Elisa. Yeah, so I think that's a that's a great question, and I think it's becoming really relevant nowadays when um, we're really trying to push the thermal performance of um, our facades uh, to obviously try to reduce the the amount of energy we use to keep buildings cooler or warmer. Um, when you're comparing, it, if we say that we want to compare apples for apples, and we want to compare a handset brickwork construction with a brick face precast, um, both of those conditions, um, when trying to, to um, achieve the current performance requirements, they would both need to incorporate insul minimum thickness of insulation. Um, and it, the the big difference between the two kind of buildups is is actually first off where that insulation um, is located. So, on your handset brickwork, you would usually be incorporating that insulation in the cavities, sort of be, uh, on the back of your of your brick. Um, and with the brick face uh, precast construction, you would be including that on the back of the concrete. Um, in terms of of performance, the insulation would um, would probably be around the same thickness, let's assume. Um, but the big difference between the two buildups would be on the brick face uh, precast, your um, connection brackets, assuming that you're using a, a cladding uh, type construction, um, they would be a major, or there would be thermal bridges through the buildup. So obviously an analysis needs to be carried out to understand uh, what 
what the, the heat losses would occur through that. Uh, but there's options uh, to be able to um, insulate around those brackets to be able to to um, to reduce the effect of, of, of that thermal. And in fact, the, this is the strategy that's being used in the UK where the um, the U values or the thermal requirements of facades are, are more straight in in Australia um, from if you're looking then at the handset brickwork construction the um, you get sort of a similar uh, effect with the um, the connections that are uh, supporting and restraining the uh, handset brickwork and those connections actually happen much more frequently um, so it's a uh, uh, just to try to summarize that answer the two Two solutions can achieve your thermal performance. Of course, it's a matter of looking specifically at your project requirements um, and looking at the the best approach of um, progressing the details to be able to get your, your better thermal performance overall. Thank you. Thanks for that, Alyssa. I might direct the next couple of questions through to Dean. And we've had one that's come through from Alexander in. Victoria that's talking about the aesthetics of the brick precast panels and Alexander is asking Eugene how do you avoid the brickwork panel uh, the brickwork looking like panels and more like a proper masonry wall is it possible to add in brick slips, brick slips over joint locations thanks Alexander great question Dean your thoughts thanks Amanda uh I guess that's the that's the magic uh, yeah that's the magic question. Can you make this wall look like a brick wall and and not a precast wall? At the end of the day, uh, we have to still have control joints, and I think uh, no matter what uh, construction methodology you use, you'd still have control joints, and that's what we try to achieve on this one. Um, yes, the control joints might be closer than standard brick control joints. But uh, we try to hide these then by joint sealing with the same color as the bricks, and that tended to to hide uh, yeah the hide the control joints much better. If you've got a chance, I'd say download the, a copy of the video that you just watched. Go through my presentation. You might see the photos of the project in question again, uh, and you you get a notice of how you can you can determine where the control joints are. I wouldn't recommend putting any brick slips over those joints because you just start limiting the, the movement which you need to have for your typical construction. And from a client perspective, what are the current requests and the current trends in this space? What are, what are the clients looking for? I guess the clients are looking for something different. Um, they obviously would not just want a standard uh, brick-faced building. They were going for nifty little details. We had uh, a picture frame window with a precast span spandrel beneath it. Uh, also, precast in this sense actually created the entire panel in one mold. Uh, uh, the brick panel was built in one and a sawtooth pattern on the spandrel as well. Uh, we had a typical uh, picture frame window, which was quite skinny and, and narrow. So I guess, um, it, it, the, the only way you can uh, differentiate yourself is by being a little bit unique and uh, there will be some curveballs thrown the engineers ways but uh, a pretty good company like like Austral were, were quite onto it in terms of the modeling and the engineering behind designing these precast panels to work while building so that collaboration piece is important and maybe for all stakeholders to be involved up front. Um, we hear a lot about that at Engineers Australia. Do you think that does does that hang true for for, for what you do, Dean? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, well, this project was a design and construct, and I was lucky to be involved quite early on since I think the award of tender, uh, and I had quite a lot of uh, yeah meetings with the engineers, architects, and then eventually with all store precast once we let them on board um, and we took it from zero to to, to go to her um, it was great uh, to work with them uh, a lot of collaboration required thanks Dean for that and just circling back to the panel joints we've had a question come in from Greg to you Dean again asking can you elaborate on the makeup of panel joints how the drain and any redundancy recommended in the system? Thanks, Greg, for that question. Uh, Dean? Yeah, perfect. Um, I would say uh, if we just thought about this panel joint as a standard precast panel joint, 
and we'd stick with the same detailing. I guess I have no experience with uh, the precast brick as a cladding system only with a load bearing wall behind it. Uh, because we use this as our load bearing wall, these panels were actually installed panel to panel uh, with the rebate in for the slab. So we had the slab connecting into these panels at every level, which was you know, a better way to go about it. For us, it was more conventional precast con concrete construction that way. And yes, we had to waterproof our joints. We had to fire rate our joints because obviously that's an external wall as well. So because we had multi-use apartments, uh, we had multi-level apartments, so we had to basically fire rate level to level and across each individual apartment horizontally as well. So from our point of view, it was traditional precast construction with the added bonus of uh, brick tiles uh, stuck on to the outside of the panels. Thanks, Dean. And Poralis is having a few technical issues, so I'm going to have to ask you to work a little bit harder tonight, Dean, and um, I do appreciate that. Let's hope we can get Alyssa back um, shortly. I think she's coming back soon. Um, I might move to a question, a really interesting question that's coming from Richard. Uh, good evening to you, asking you, Dean, can all building services, water, electrical, data, gas, pipes and conduits be integrated into the panels during the precast process. Thanks, Richard. I've never, um, I've never had that happen before. I, I guess you could. It would take a lot of coordination to, to integrate your services into a precast panel. Uh, and I would say well, I'd rather stick to not doing that and keep the panels as structural panels. Yes, uh, if they were cast on site, you could have uh, your service trades running pipe work into it, but being a precast panel cast off site, um, the panels would need to be joined up and you'd need to have all your pipe work connecting in. So if you treat it as a standard precast panel, you probably wouldn't do that uh, in the normal case. So I wouldn't do it with a, with a brick precast panel either. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dean. And Alyssa, welcome back. Good to have you back. Um, so we'll move to a question. We've had a great question and I know you covered it in your presentation, but maybe you can expand a little. It's coming from Uma in Victoria asking you, Alyssa, how does brick snap work with precast panel in terms of strength? Good question. So the, um, the actual brick fix precast has acts very much like um, um, another precast panel. So in terms of strength is, is, is an equal, assuming that you're using the same uh, concrete thicknesses. Um, and the, the actual connection uh, between the, the brick and the concrete it can be very strong. Of course, the specific project requirements um, may require a, for um, a stronger connection between that brick and, and the concrete. And I covered that briefly for one of the president's projects um, I discussed. So th there's different options. It, the, definitely the, the main thing is to make sure that there is that engagement between the back of the brick um, and the, the concrete itself when it's poured. Um, and if we have a project where more stringent requirements are in place, then uh, looking into or incorporating any um, any rots on the back um, that can give us sort of that extra strength in the in the connection. Thank you for that, Alyssa. And just staying with you, we've had a question from uh, Arsenal in New South Wales, and this is an interesting question because it's talking about longevity, um, and he's asking you, Alyssa, are these brick face panels approved by the New South Wales building industry to use? Um, what about its longevity, water leaking or any other weather related damage, which with all the um, floods, et cetera, that we've had, I was going to ask you later as well, um, any impact on this type of construction? Thanks, Alyssa. Um, so I think when, when we're looking at the brick face precast panels, um, again, they, they're very much, uh, they would behave as a, a, a fair face concrete finish precast panel. Um, so in that respect, the, um, the durability is, is very similar. Um, whenever we, we are um, building brick face precast panels um, and looking specifically at the, um, at the performance of that connection, I think we've covered that as well. Um, and, and looking more into the, the weather proving 
um, around the the joints. Dean has has touched on on a couple of uh, solutions. I think they were very good. Um, what's what's quite key and definitely in my experience is looking at what the what standards, uh, what the standards and the guides uh, recommend in terms of detailing. There's there's different options. I've had projects where um, we we don't, we include say uh, two seals of silicon within the construction and of the joints. And what's important is to make sure that um, one of those seals is definitely on the concrete portion because you know, we need to remember that the, the bricks themselves are. Um, they do collect a bit of water, um, and any any uh, any of that water, there is a risk of um, of ingress of water ingress th ingress through the joint um, if we do not include a a silicon a layer on the actual concrete um, surface. Uh, similarly, there, there's other solutions where you can include um, baffles within the construction. And what I've seen in the past is that it many times is is uh, it's a matter of discussing this with the, with the precasters because um, they will have the, their own preference in terms of systems and detailing. Um, and I think ultimately uh, what we recommend is for for a off-site weather test if, if possible for the buildups, but definitely looking at doing on-site testing, uh, for example, host testing, which we would usually have, say, for unitized curtain walling facades. Uh, but having that that um, on-site testing will give us the ultimate assurance that the, the detail has been installed uh, correctly and that it will be um, performing over time. Um, and I think the the last point that is is good to mention as well is that some of this um, it, many of these details actually they they can't be accessed. Um, and what that means is that should there be any issue during the the life of the building, the the repairs can take place. And that's quite key when looking at the the use and the performance of the facade over time, um, as as it will help the the end user to manage the. Um, the, the performance of, of the facade and the weather tightness over time. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. And just staying with you before we move back to Dean, um, Deepti in Victoria has uh, sent us a question around custom build residential homes with the question being, how is this applicable for custom built residential homes where no two buildings are the same, unlike volume mm -hmm. builders? Thank you, Deepti. Uh, Deepti, great question. Elissa, can you answer that one? Yeah, definitely. So um, I mentioned during my presentation that whenever we we start off during the design process, it is quite key to start looking at the the architecture um, and also starting to to understand how we can start panelizing the facade. And I think this this highlights the fact that the, the whole process is very much project specific because it will be dependent on the architectural intent, the locations of the panels, what sizes they have. Um, so it, it's, it's definitely a process that needs to, to occur on, on, a, on a project by project basis. Thanks, Alyssa. And Dean, we've had a couple of questions on risk and compliance. I might start with compliance. And this question is coming from Isaac. Good evening to you, asking you, Dean, how is compliance with FP 1.4 achieved, i.e. demonstrated with this product and its junctions? Uh, Dean. Yep. So uh, we achieved FP 1.4 compliance on the last project as well. Uh, through a facade engineer and it would be uh, on this one uh, as per any typical precast project you'd have to demonstrate that the uh, waterproof joints are, are detailed properly your horizontal and vertical joints um, and the only thing that was slightly different for us on this was the window openings um, when you've got the four-sided window opening which is picture framed at the panel uh, with brickwork obviously as Elisa said brickwork lets uh, lets water into the 10 millimeter joints or seven millimeter joints. So there is potential for water to get in through the brickwork and make its way past the window frames. Uh, to get by this, we actually uh, went over and above the waterproofing code. Now you'd normally only install a, a backstop water angle uh, horizontally on the, on the window sill. We uh, installed an angle all four sides of the window. And uh, the actual way we mitigated uh, even any further water ingress is we cut a groove 
in the panel and inserted the angle with silicon into that groove. So that was creating a, a physical barrier. Um, through this uh, detail, uh, the engineer was happy to uh, sign off FP 1.4. We also provided host testing on site to international standards and uh, none of the windows tested uh, at least. So we are pretty confident that uh, at least through the windows, window openings and joints, we've done all we can to, to provide water tightness. Um, I guess if anything else had to, had to fail, that would be something that uh, we'd have to deal with at the time. Thanks, Dean. Thank you. Um, sustainability, top of mind for most people today. Um, Alyssa, a question that has come in asking, can precast panels be made sustainable and environmentally friendly? Thanks, Alyssa. So I think it's a very relevant question to uh, the discussions going on nowadays, and it's it's definitely something that um, we we we're starting to look into and and learning more about it as as um, as more as we start looking at the project specifics. Um, from from a sustainability point of view, I, and I think I briefly touched on this during the presentation. Um, whenever we're using these panels as load bearing, um, we are um, in, improving the um, the usage of, of, of the panels themselves because they no longer are uh, cladding panels that are um, attached to, to the building, but they are actually um, helping with the overall building stability and the, the, the structural design. So um, if we start a, making this panels low bearing, um, we can look with the, the the structural engineers to use those panels as if they were um, slab edge columns, and and they provide that kind of um, that, that additional support. Um, it, in addition to this, uh, precasters are are now uh, starting to look at ways in which they can make their own manufacturing much more sustainable, um, and they're able to provide the documentation to to address that. Um, ultimately, it's it's something that all of the whole industry is is getting together to um, to help uh, move forward, and and it's definitely exciting times in terms of uh, what we're we're being able to achieve um, on the sustainability front. Dean, do you want to comment on sustainability from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, we've been, been involved with quite a few projects where we are trying to achieve green star ratings and the like. Um, I guess there are lots of factors to consider uh, looking at sustainability. Um, and I guess from a longevity point of view, concrete precast panels are, are meant to uh, be quite uh, environmentally friendly as well. And there are some manufacturers who are using green, earth-friendly concrete, uh, sustainable resources uh, and the like. So I guess it would depend project to project and uh, obtaining more information from your uh, manufacturer. Thanks, Dean. And we've had a few questions around three points, so I will group some together. And Alyssa, if I could start with you. Um, we've had a question, are these panels of standard size or made to order? And we also had a, another question as to what is the maximum size limit for the uh, panels? Is that something you can talk to, Alyssa? Yeah, definitely. Um, so they, it, the panels could come in standard sizes, and when you're carrying out your your panelization studies for your project, you you do try to standardize those sizes and those shapes um, to make it more uh, cost effective and more efficient from a manufacturing point of view. Um, however, it's as I mentioned before, it's it's something that is is very project specific, and and it's it's. Unless the the buildings are are like for like, it's definitely something that that we need to be looked at individually. Um, from a transportation point of view, it, the, there are limitations both at the at the precasters uh, facilities, so they will have limitations as to how big um, they can cast the panels. And of course, there will be limits in terms of transportations, which are usually the um, let's call the the limiting factor when looking into this. So, for example, I've I've worked on projects where um, the the height of the panels were limited to about four meters, um, but we looked into making panels about nine meters long. But of course, it's as part of the, the process of looking into the, the maximum sizes for the panels. It's important to also understand what the, the route of delivery for these panels will be and making sure that it, it is within the, 
the, the transport, uh, the road limitations for for the transportation itself. And I think it, in addition to to actual the transportation, the the transportation limitations, I I meant I touched on this briefly in my presentation. Um, we need to uh, make sure that it is within the the crane lifting limits, um, and that is that is another key component um, of of the panelization process and understanding how how big we can go and how heavy we can go. Thanks, Elisa. And the second part of the question is, um, how do we introduce these panels in sloping levels? So it's a, it's a good question. Um, and uh, I'll refer back to the Melbourne Connect project uh, um, uh, that was presented earlier today. And there you can see that the, the brick face precast panel was um, at an angle. And um, the way that that was cast is you, you cast it flat um, just to be able to, to control the, the concrete mix when you're pouring it. Um, so it's, it's, the precasters are quite smart about around the ways that they can cast this. Um, and I think if definitely having flat surfaces is, is a plus um, and it makes it much easier. So I think even if we're looking at, um, at elevations that are at an angle, um, there's ways in which we can cast them on a flat surface and then being able to then um, transform that onto a, a, a sloped a facade. Thank you. And just one more part and then I'll let you take a breath, Alyssa. Um, third part is what's the wall material composition? Um, so on the brick face uh, precast panels, we would have a, a thickness of the brick. Um, many times that is dependent on the brick that is selected. Uh, so I know Dean mentioned before that in, in the project he worked in, um, they looked at, at bricks which were 20 millimeters thick. Um, I've worked on projects as well where, where we go maybe to 50 millimeters thick for the brick. Um, many times it's related to using a standard brick and, and cutting it in half. Um, and then the, the concrete itself, it needs to be designed based on the, the structural requirements. Um, on projects where where we have a panels behaving as, as cladding components rather than load bearing, the, the thickness of the concrete was uh, between 120 and 150 millimeters. Um, but then if you're looking at a load bearing brick face precast construction, it will be subject to the specific engineering requirements of the building. Thank you, Elisa. And circling back, we had a compliance question and now Wessel has introduced um, Rhys. Good evening to you. Dean, Wessel is asking about cranes. Um, risk introduced used to handling on site. Um, were our cranes involved? Yes, there's always risk when handling precast panels, and that's something we've got to deal with. Uh, we just have to be extra careful, um, make sure that you know, none of the bricks, uh, brick faces were damaged. Um, and to be honest, in the entire project, what with about 86 panels, I think we had one panel that had a slight chip, and that might have been while it was being installed. Um, so I guess a very small percentage of damage occurred. Uh, but like Elisa was saying, you know, where cranes are involved, you have to uh, be very careful and obviously detail the panels to, to suit your cranage. Um, on, on large cranes, yes, you can probably go with panels up to about 12, uh, 15 tons. Uh, the most I did on this one was 11. Um, and that was just because of the, the reach and uh, the limitation factors of, of the crane. But there's, there's always risk factors involved. And uh, I guess... Uh, uh, because they were structural load panels, uh, they, they were treated with quite a lot of care. Thank you for that. Thanks. And staying with you, Dean, um, Anthony has sent through a question talking about cost. Uh, the question to you, Dean, is are the cost comparisons over the whole life at, over the whole asset life or solely up to the practical completion of construction? Great question, Anthony. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, my calculations were just up to PC on the project. So that does not take into account whole of life uh, remediation and repair costs. Um, from our point of view, uh, it was quite a, uh, an, ex an expensive uh, outcome, but a high quality outcome for the client. So we believe that uh, there's quite a lot of longevity uh, available for the client with the system. 
Thanks, Dean. And Alyssa, back to you. A question that's coming from Richard, asking you, instead of embedding clay-fired bricks into the concrete panel during the precast process, can the mould be fabricated to provide a false brick texture and then be dipped in a clay brick pigment? Thanks, Richard. Great question. Alyssa. Yeah, so this this is a quite interesting approach to um, to achieving the, the aesthetics. Um, so you can definitely um, have texture on the on the precast panels. Um, you can use form liners, which uh, can come in standard shapes and and textures, geometry, etc. Um, and and those ones uh, with those ones, you can you can try to achieve that kind of texture on the surface. Now, in terms of then applying any finishes on the, the concrete, I suppose it would be a matter of looking at the specific product being proposed, as we would need to be quite careful that um, that the, the paint or the, the product itself can um, last a, for the design life of the building itself without having to um, to go back and repaint. Um, because I would say that the, the moment we need to go back and, and repaint, um, it, it's it's then not giving us exactly the same performance as a brick face precast uh, construction, and and I think I, I would also um, I would also ask whether the the architect would be happy with with that approach. Um, definitely the the projects I've worked on um, they they were quite um, quite intent on using brick as a material and and. I would question whether they would have been happy taking a um, an alternative to that, but it's a good question. It's definitely a good. It's an interesting um, approach and alternative. Thanks, Alyssa. And just staying with you for now, um, we've had a question come in from Hong Loi asking: brick precast panels versus concrete precast panel. Which one is better? Which one is a better deal in terms of cost, durability? Buildability. So, in terms of um, durability, we're we're probably looking at very similar um, construction, um, and uh, and just overall in terms of cost, uh, you would need to start looking at the the added cost of putting the, the uh, brick um, the brick face on the panels themselves. So um, the my my sort of initial conclusion to this would be that probably your brick face precast would be um, slightly more expensive than just a fair face concrete finish. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, the the two options would be giving you a different aesthetic. So ultimately, it would be a matter of of understanding what the the architectural intent is and what the client's expectations are. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and Dean, moving on to fireproofing, uh, we've had a question to you. Can you please explain about fireproofing ceiling? Yeah, so uh, if you treat these as standard precast panels, the fire rated joint ceiling has to be done as per code and as per any other panel. Uh, so nothing, nothing different there. Uh, I guess if you had a, a cladding system or, on your building, uh, then that would have to be treated uh, differently. And you'd have to ensure that the cladding obviously was not uh, flammable at all and passed all the required standards. Uh, but yeah, typical fire rating was pretty simple on this one with joint ceiling. Thanks, Dean. We've had a question coming from Hans, who's obviously in a happy mood because he's put a smiley face in there. Thank you for that, Hans, and good evening. Um, Hans is asking, what is the weight for panel for an ins installation point of view? Is that possible one on T? Is that you, Dean, or Alyssa? Um, I guess uh, the, the panel will depend on the typical uh, concrete density um, and so obviously your size of panel determines the weight and again you'd be limited by the crane on site so as long as your crane can lift it uh, and as long as the precast yard can lift it onto a truck you can get the panel delivered to site if it's the right size. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks Dean and Hans goes on to say how do you protect the brick from lesson learned from delivery to installation? Hopefully I would say <laughs> I would say there was no real way to bubble wrap the panels. Um, you just have to be careful on site. Uh, it is a, a concrete product or masonry product at the end of the day, so it is brittle. Um, and yes, you know, bricks will chip off, but 
in a way, you know, we had a few areas that looked like they were slightly chipped or slightly damaged. And when I got the client to come out and have a look at it at the end, thinking that they were defected, it was actually something that, that they appreciated because that makes it look like a real brick building. And I guess that's uh, one of the questions that was you had earlier, Amanda, was whether you can uh, mm. use a form liner and then paint it afterwards. The problem with that is it just looks too fake um, and it looks too perfect and it looks like tiles and uh, the clients want to see real brick with real character. And so they appreciated the variances in color and the variances in texture and a few damaged bricks here and there was fine because you know if it was a typical brick building, you would get some bricks being damaged even by normal bricklayers uh, laying their bricks. Alyssa, do you want to come on, on that from a design point of view? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the uh, whenever we're looking at uh, the the penalization uh, studies for the building, we we usually um, ha want to try to re uh, limit the the weight of the panels to about ten tons. So this very much aligns with the the feedback that Dean was giving before. Um, and then in in terms of any damages to the um, to the recast panels themselves it it's it's a good question and and it's it's very similar to to any other kind of facade we it's a matter of of um, controlling the the transportation conditions as well as um, post installation protecting the facades themselves um, as a as an interesting additional bit of information the the project that uh, the last project that i presented actually uh, we had a couple of issues with some of the bricks in that um in that facade and the the strategy that was agreed with the contractor was that um whenever there were uh, those those chips that were unacceptable to the architect and the client uh, those bricks were were removed and they were replaced with new bricks now um the replacement bricks incorporated a series of of rods stainless steel rods on the on the back and they were grouted onto the um the precast panel itself just to create that strong bond thank you Alyssa. thank you that was a great explanation um looking at a whole of life approach a question coming from Juan louis good evening to you asking you dean what kind of maintenance requirements are expected to be associated to the brick face precast panels I would say, and this is obviously uh, determining by different manufacturers, but no maintenance from our point of view. Uh, we gave the bricks a, a good scrub and a clean uh, on the way down. So as we brought our scaffold down and uh, we had the capability to do, we gave the bricks a scrub and a wash um, just to get rid of any construction dust uh, and debris. Um, but uh, there shouldn't be any requirement to, to wash in future. Um, the bricks will have character, gain a life of their own and fade and change color with time. And uh, yeah, um, it, it, that'll probably be a totally different building in four or five years, but that's the nature of, uh, of brickwork. Thanks, thank you. Um, we are coming towards the end. Uh, a question from Stephanus asking you, Dean, why don't you just use a mold with a brick motive rather than actual bricks? Yeah, I just I think I covered that question a little while ago, but that's exactly why we we want the character of brick. Um, and we've found in the past I have used form liners, and even on this project we used form liner for a few different areas. You can just tell that form liner is is fake. Um, just doesn't look like brick. Doesn't feel like brick, and uh, the color will never match what you're trying to achieve. It'll be too uniform if you dip. Uh, the panel in, in a color and as Elisa mentioned you have to determine whether that panel uh, can actually accept that color whether there's future maintenance uh, for that for repainting in future because once these uh, panels start to, the paint starts to fade and starts to peel off you will then yeah become really noticeable so if you want to go with a brick finish uh, I would say go with a, a real brick finish a traditional brick insert or a, a brick slip and we have a couple more questions, but uh, one again for you, Dean. How does the precast system compare with traditional in terms of potential for brick reuse and facade disassembly? I would say uh, uh, the system that we use, which is a load bearing panel, there is no disassembly uh, going to be achievable on this because these panels were intrinsic into the structure of the building. 
and definitely no brick reuse. Uh, these brick slips manufactured by Austral are specifically made for uh, precast panels. They aren't just a straight brick slip. They've actually got a dovetail uh, on the rear and that dovetail uh, protrudes into the concrete and provides that that bond that Lisa was talking about earlier. So where some panels had, where some bricks had stainless steel rods or holes or grooves, these had a dovetail that, that went into the reinforcing and then stuck into there. So you will not be pulling these brick slips out of the panel at all in the future. Thank you for that, Dean. Thank you. And I just want to finish up on talking about, obviously, there's a lot of exciting things happening. Australia is in, in the midst of one of its biggest construction booms um, of all time, if not the biggest. And uh, just for all our young engineers that are coming through and people involved in the infrastructure sector, I just wonder, starting with you, Alyssa, if there's some advice you could give them. And I've kept that question uh, deliberately broad. I think it's just, uh, as you mentioned, Amanda, it's, it's quite an exciting time to be working in construction. Um, there's definitely quite a lot of of a uh, um, new of new solutions coming up um, as an answer to to the sustainability discussion there there's quite a lot of digital tools happening so i think it's definitely keeping keeping an eye out for for what other people are doing uh trying to learn from that and um and definitely just uh yeah just as le learn and and as much as you as you can just because the 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 industry changes over time and and it's i think it's one of the beauties of working in construction thank you thank you dean do you want to bring us home yeah thanks amanda um i i guess i've got a different viewpoint as well i i i'm an engineer but i went straight into contracting thought i'd give it a few years and then make my way back into design i just loved contracting and um ended up staying on site uh and love what I do. I love getting my boots dirty <laughs> every day. Um, but I guess for any young engineer, make sure you're passionate, uh, love what you do. And if you find a niche market or a niche trade you want to explore, uh, just a pursuit of the passion um, and never stop learning. And I would suggest any design engineer who wants to gain more experience on site as well to spend quite a bit more time on site, uh, speak to the uh, site uh, site managers, project managers, foremen, uh, the guys on the tools. Uh, they will really uh, help you and explain how things can get built, um, you know, that you might not uh, be aware of. So sometimes that buildability factor comes into it and, and is really important in the design moving forward. Wonderful advice. Pursue with passion and never stop learning. And I think that applies to all of us and uh, our senior engineers as well. As always, that's all we have time for this evening. And please join me once again in thanking Deal Suman and Alyssa Hernandez Montero for their time and input tonight. I'd also like to thank Engineers Australia's long-standing industry partner, Austral Precast, for their ongoing support. If you could take a couple of minutes to complete a short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below, this helps us improve and plan for future sessions. Thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you at our next Thought Leaders event. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>